Would you mind loaning me some of your lipstick, Mom? Because I want to at least look pretty the next time you decide to f*** me! Welcome back to Crystal Clear on the Roundtable. I'm Oscar Vox, and I don't even know where to begin with Pink Diamond. I have so many ideas and theories on just about everything related to her. Why her mural looks so different from the real deal. Her relationship with the diamonds. Her relationship with Rose Quartz. Why Stevani is able to access her memories. There's just so much. Nevertheless, you clicked on this video from its title or thumbnail and probably figured out the topic I settled on for this installment. And it's tied back to one of the first things that jump out at you during the reveal of Pink Diamond. She's tiny, defective, overcooked, off color, whatever label you see fit. Now, this is something we theorized before on this channel, and you best believe I was absolutely ecstatic to have this come to fruition. Not to say this channel was the only place on earth to come up with such an idea, but to be such a strong supporter of an idea and see it validated before your very eyes is a warm, fuzzy feeling to say the least. The signs were there. The fact Steven and Paradox were enough to fill up a throne made for a diamond. The fact Blue Diamond hunched over came to equal height with Pink's palakine. Her pillow in the zoo being quite large and scaled to a human, but still tiny for a diamond. Plus, this series just loves drawing parallels upon parallels, and being the runt or outcast of a group has been a recurring theme since day one. Hell, three of our cast literally have their own clique called the Shorty Squad. Yet, I think a majority of us were taken aback at just how small Pink Diamond was. With all the previous factors coupled with the brief yet hopeful flashback in Gemcation, I thought she'd be noticeably shorter than Yellow and Blue Diamond, but still tower over a bulk of gems. Yet, is Stevani's skill is anything to go by and not just her dream, but afterwards when examining the window pink shattered, she was as tall, if not a little taller, than Rose Quartz or Jasper. Oh no, I hear it. All the pink diamond is Rose Quartz theories. No, not today. I'm taking a stand. Let me live, please. Pink diamond being so small is just terrifying, honestly. Knowing that even a diamond, who have been stated to be absolutely, totally, completely flawless beings, can, well, be the exact opposite of that, shows that at the end of the day, Homeworld as a whole is taking a huge gamble. Every single gem they create, even diamonds, all have a risk of becoming defective, off-color, either at emergence or later on down the road by a change in allegiance and moral code. The idea that they're the strongest the universe has to offer is an illusion, and Pink Diamond's existence more or less perpetuates that. This got me thinking, disregarding all prior speculations, from a narrative standpoint, we were exposed to the true identity of Pink Diamond, her physique, her, at least initial, personality, at this certain point in time for a reason. There's a purpose behind telling us this after being introduced to the idea that strings of a shattering were pulled by a higher power. It makes you wonder what other strings were pulled building up to Pink Diamond's demise. If Pink Diamond was being sabotaged and led into a deceptive position of power that entire time. And the answer to that is, yes, she was. At the time of Yellow Diamond's conversation with Pink Diamond and Joga Moon, Pink had absolutely nothing to her name. No army, no colony, and possibly not even a pearl. We can't deduce this for sure. As although no one that would have represented Pink Pearl was in the flashback, Yellow Pearl was asking as well, and considering we see her oh so charming selfie in the database, she was around during the colonization of the planet Jungle Moon orbits. We know Pink Diamond landed the Earth as her first colony, but we're still left in the dark on everything between her argument with Yellow Diamond and actually obtaining the planet. She could have been granted the Earth shortly after, or eons later after more bickering and persistence. We just don't know, but I'm assuming we're just getting started with the dream flashbacks this season, so don't expect to be left in the dark for too long. For Pink Time to get her own colony, she, or possibly even Mother Yellow and Mommy Blue, likely had to go through the Mad Daddy Diamond of them all, White Diamond. <laughs> Yeah, good luck getting a face reveal of her anytime soon. You know how long it took to get a face reveal of Mr. Tipton on the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody? Season 3 of its sequel series, Sweet Life on Deck. It'll probably take twice as long for White Diamond if we're factoring in the pacing of the story and the hiatuses. White Diamond 2020! As many, many Steven Universe fans have theorized, White Diamond is the true head of Homeworld and Gem Kind. And considering the rankings via the Diamond Authority placement has held up true until now, let's not even try to argue it. 
That being said, she'd more than likely supervise and have the final say on the planets the diamonds invade for colonization. At least, until she feels they have a grip and eventually lets them do their own thing, so she can focus on her own colonies and gems. White Diamond is likely the embodiment of everything her world stands for. That includes the hive mind mentality and desire for perfection, the concept of a flawless being and a flawless empire. So, I imagine she'd have a bone or two to pick with Pink Diamond, and I'm interested in us getting a concrete answer on why she didn't have Pink Diamond disposed of as soon as she emerged. Did Blue and Yellow vouch to keep her? Did White want to see how she can behave compared to her colleagues? Was she an experimental diamond, a pet project in the first place? Why does this show raise more questions with every answer they give us? They think this is funny? Regardless, the fact Pink Diamond was denied her diamond duties for this long in Jungle Moon's flashback is very telling. It shows that White Diamond wasn't willing to grace her with everything a diamond's created to do. It shows that there was doubt, restraint, and neglect. I don't see any of that subsiding just because Pink yelled, I want a colony, over and over like a child wailing in a toy store. A colony? An army? Everything that goes into it? Is not just a lot of responsibility, but a lot of resources. And as we can see from modern day homeworld, resources won't last forever and don't come by easily. Speaking of resources, something we've become familiar with as we plunge deeper into the lore of the series is that resources are essential to the creation and efficiency of a gem. Thus, picking a planet where gems can be creative and thrive has to be an intricate process. Everything, temperature, weather conditions, soil, nutrients, it's all integral to not only the location of a kindergarten, but the results of a gem's production. With that in mind, I imagine an ideal planet for gem production and colonization is one that's consistent. And when I mean consistent, I mean consistent in everything. Weather, temperature, climate, only having one consistent season. The same every day of every year. That is the key to a successful gem colony. Which is why White Diamond selected a planet she knew Pink couldn't maintain a successful colony in. That's why she chose the Earth. A planet that's always changing and never stays the same. A planet that rains, snows, gets hot, gets cold. A planet with seasons and wild conditions. This alone already eliminates various locations for kindergartens and narrows the list to only a few spots. This idea is validated with the prime and beta kindergartens. Paradox remarks the prime kindergarten was an ideal spot. Great location, great holes, consistent spacing, great depth, yet, the Beta Kindergarten was made in a pinch. It's small, the gem's holes didn't even line up. Even with all the urgency of fighting off the rebellion, it goes to show Pink's gems had little options of where they could throw up more kindergartens, and had to settle for such an area that just barely managed. Why would White sabotage Pink like this? To teach her a lesson, to put her in her proper place. Pink was in such a hurry to prove herself and be on everyone's level that she was eager to defy White's pecking order. So White Diamond made sure she wouldn't get past a first colony to begin with. White chose the Earth for Pink because she knew there, gems had a higher chance of coming out defective than proper. And she was right. While Peridot already explained the Beta Kindergarten was a mess of a project, and as we can gather from the exit holes, most of the soldiers born from this location were defective and barely got the job done, look no further than the Prime Kindergarten's Amethyst at Pink Diamond Zoo. Despite being praised as such a great location for growing gems, most of the Famethysts have noticeable defects. Whether if it's varying in height, width, inconsistencies in their hair, or so on, or just inabilities in their overall performance. They do not fit the homeworld standard. We know for a fact this is common with Pink Diamond's gems by High Blue Agate's line and gem heist when meeting Sapphire. You'll have to forgive them, they're from Earth. As if to say, yeah, Earth gems are screwed, pay no attention to them, they all came out wrong. To be fair, the notion that gems made on Earth were affected differently from the rest of gem kind is nothing new, but this is more of a matter of why than how. Yet, the sabotage doesn't end there, and this next piece of evidence more or less solidifies that yes, Pink owning the most amount of defected gems was 100% intentional. As we know from our first trip to Homeworld, not all of Pink's gems came from Earth. We even did a theory on this channel that the off-colors, 
or at least the bulk of them, once you account for all the gems that make up fluorite, stem from Pink Diamond's court. And that's a theory I still hold close to me. When Steven and Lars are escorted to Pink Diamond's section of Homeworld's Mega Kindergarten, you can notice something strange. Now, a kindergarten of that scale producing so many gems would naturally cause a few to come out deformed or merged, like the Rutile twins. So it's not a shock to see more holes like that in the cave that the off coders took refuge in. Yet, once we step back and actually compare Blue Diamond's sector to Pink Diamond's, you realize there's a lot more flawed exit holes than normal. It feels as if almost every other few exit holes are merged together, which as a result, caused the gems to come out deformed. Not only that, but the exit holes also begin to vary in more sizes and rugged shapes. That can't be a coincidence or mistake, Especially since, hello? It's the same kindergarten! Pink Diamond couldn't catch a break. Poor girl, I have no doubts. The gems of Pink Diamond's court were set up to be off-color defects from the very beginning, all to get back at her for wanting to be treated on the same level of respect of everyone else despite her own flaws. Obviously, there were a few exceptions, like Homeworld's Golden Courts, Jasper. Unfortunately, those exceptions weren't enough to prevent Pink Diamond from meeting a gruesome end, although no amount of strength in the galaxy may have been able to combat a calculated plan. A plan that, if a diamond was truly involved, may have stemmed from the other diamonds noticing that despite coming out defective, Pink was putting out some pretty powerful gems. We already know Rose Quartz was OP, but look how strong Jasper was! Defective or not, other Jaspers may have been forces to be reckoned with as well, and we haven't even began to see Morganites. The raw power of Pink's court caused White Diamond's plan to backfire on her. At least, until Pink was shattered. But as always, these are just my thoughts and I'd love to hear yours. Do you agree Pink Diamond and her gems were sabotaged from the get-go by being given the Earth? Or is it possible Pink chose the Earth herself? Drop your thoughts in the comments below, or tweet them to me at AustricVox or at The Roundtable on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Roundtable Vids. If you enjoyed this video, please sort of like, share, and if you're new here, subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications to stay in the loop with all things Steven. I hope you have a beautiful day. See ya!